in a way, a dream is so different than writing because a dream is unconscious, obviously. Plus, it's so random. You have no control over it. You don't edit it. You can't go back. You're not even sure where all those things come from. But in writing, you have that power. So you can go over everything you've done, you know, as many times as you want and try and figure out what's working in this character and what isn't. You're controlling it where dreams are not controllable. And that makes them a completely different animal so that when you're thinking about writing, <clears throat> I can consciously say, I want these personality traits to work or I don't want these or I want, I, I've done this, but it's not working. And so I can revise it as I wish. So if I'm gonna do that, if I'm going to try and invest a character with personality traits, either from me or from you or from anyone, I can be super conscious of that act. And I, can, I know that I can create the character so that he is showing them <clears throat> or demonstrating them or whatever it is. So I don't, I think the answer to your question, but who knows, right? I think the answer to your question is no, that I don't consciously think that any given character is setting out certain traits that represent me. Now, having just said that, <clears throat> um, Holling is, for the most part, I think the closest I will ever get to autobiography. So that when I am thinking about him acting, I do think, well, what would I have done in sixth or seventh grade? How would I have responded? Um, how did I respond in some cases since some of the episodes are, are straight? Um, and that means that somehow, yes, he is in my, a lot of the things that are going on in his life and how he's feeling about them from the war to lima beans um, are really quite straight, are exactly who I am. Good evening, and although I would love to take credit for just the two of us working on this, it never could have happened without all of the people and the resources to be able to put such a fabulous program together. So it's my honor to, re to let you know that Alan Reed's 2023 received time, resources, and financial support from several businesses, organizations, and people. We'd like to thank Alan ISD, Lovejoy ISD, the Foundation for Allen Schools, the Foundation for Lovejoy Schools for their participation, their financial participation in this program, the Rotary Club of Allen, Allen Arts Alliance, the Allen Philharmonic, Shakespeare Dallas, the Allen Public Library, but most especially the Friends of the Allen Public Library. The Allen Reads committee members this year are Jane Bennett, J.J. Gillette, Kay Hawkins, Susan Jackson, Bonnie J., Tom Keener, myself, Patrick McGowan, Kimberly Richardson, Farida Ship Chandler, and numerous uh, members of the Allen Public Library, the librarians. We are so grateful to each and every one of them for the time that they helped in, um, in putting this together. So without further ado, my co-chair, Patrick McGowan. This evening's been a while coming. We, were, we actually selected books. Um, close to a year ago. And at that time, the Allen Reads 2023 committee was unanimous in its acclaim of and delighted to recommend Gary D. Schmidt's The Wednesday Wars for this year's Shakespeare Reimagined event. Many of Mr. Schmidt's books have earned national recognition, including The Wednesday Wars, which won a John Newbery Honor book. He recently retired as a professor of English at Calvin College and it gives me great pleasure to welcome Gary Schmidt as our featured visiting author for Alan Reed's 2023. Good evening. Oh, guys. Good evening. Ah, uh, there we go. <clears throat> Last weekend I was with about 30 students, college students on a bus for three days. They gave me this cold, which was nice of them. So if I sort of tra start to trail off, just sort of yell at me and say, you're trailing off and we'll see how it goes. It is um, occasionally that I get some letters from students and, or from readers. So I thought I would start tonight just by reading you a couple of these, a few of these. 
and you get, I'll give you a sense of the kinds of letters that you get. So here's the first. <clears throat> Dear Gary Schmidt, hello, Caitlin Jones here. I just wanted to say that I, th I like you very much. I personally have always wanted to meet a true author. I thought you did an okay job on First Boy. I'm not sure if my book is even that good. When I grow up, I want to be a book writer since I have already got written 27 pages, which is good, right? <clears throat> I wrote them by hand. I was wondering if I sent my book to you, would you be able to look it over without taking any ideas? <laughs> not to be mean about the idea thing, but I don't really know you. <laughs> Caitlin Jones. Gary D. Schmidt, I'm exactly 38 pages into your book, Orbiting Jupiter. And I just wanted to say, why? The dog? Oh, geez, dude, you killed the dog. I'm sitting in my first period English class on a nice, warm Friday, not expecting any emotional turmoil until at least third hour. And you just drop a cute yellow dog's death like it's nothing? I'm going to finish this book. But if one more dog dies, especially randomly, I'm, not going, to, I'm going to be very upset. <laughs> I was wondering, could I have your second book for free? I know what you're thinking. Why should I give a free book to a kid who has no money? Well, I'd be happy to, sp to spread your name so you will make much more money. If you're willing to accept this, I'd be happy to help you with any of the books you're going to write. This kid's going to be an agent someday. <clears throat> Before I finish this letter, I want to let you know a little bit about me. My name is Andrew. I'm 10 years old. I'm in fifth grade. I love reading and writing. In all of your busy work, it might be hard to get back to me, but I hope you can do it by Thursday of this week. <clears throat> also, if you can, Please make it a written letter and not a letter that you send to everyone who sends you fan mail. It's for a school project and I want to get a good grade. <laughs> this honesty, right? I mean, there's honesty there. I'm in eighth grade and my language arts teacher asked us for our book report to read a book for, by a living author. Research the author and write them a letter. I picked you because the book I had in my hand was the smallest. <laughs> Sorry, no offense, but I saw, saw your book was small, and the truth is I can't read long books because I have a short attention span. <clears throat> How often do you write? I write every day at school. That's pretty cool. Where do you write? I write at home and at school. Where do you get your ideas? I get my from books and games. How do you get published? I self-publish every story I write. Do you have any suggestions for young, reader, young writers? I need tips. Watch this, guys. I need tips on how to write softly. I don't know what that means, but isn't it lovely? Yeah. Tips to write softly. What made you become a writer yourself? I thought it was going to be fun. <laughs> From Kyle. <clears throat> Honestly, I didn't enjoy Wednesday Wars all that much. I read it for my eighth grade summer reading book. It was decent, not at the top of my list. One thing I didn't love about the book was humor. As I've told you, I'm going into eighth grade. Let me tell you, an eighth grader's sense of humor is on a completely different planet compared to Hollings. You won the Newbery Award, so obviously your book was well liked. But overall, I think that your book was kind of more mediocre. In my opinion, there were some very well written parts that I admired. Now watch this next sentence. Then there were the childish parts which weren't to my fancy. <laughs> no one has said that, right? To my fancy since 1903. But there it is. <clears throat> my name is James. I'm in the eighth grade. For our class, we had to read a book with more than 150 pages. When I opened your book and read the inside cover, I thought I'd hate the book because Cooper didn't even have a dog. The first page really drew me in uh, with a simile. The rest of the pages just kept me reading. The fact that Cooper's grandfather died helped me relate to Cooper. When I was five years old, my mother came into my room at 10 p.m. bawling, she mustered up the courage to tell me that my grandfather had died. The same grandfather I had shared apricot pinwheels with less than eight hours ago. When I found out Cooper's grandfather had died, I had to set the book down. I let it sit on the coffee table for two days 
before I tried to pick it up again. I was able to keep reading all the way through the book, and I have to say I really liked it, although I'm not much of a reader. I really did enjoy reading your book. It helped me realize that all things have to leave us one time or another. How's that, kid? All things. <clears throat> Overall, your books have some connection to a middle schooler during a war in real life. Loss of a person in your life can impact your life forever. And like in Just Like That and Pay Attention, Carter Jones, loss of Courier and Holling made them sad all the time and that everything is lost. But there's always hope that they will prevail and overcome their obstacles by the end of the book. That is why I like your books and why they're interesting and enjoyable to read to me because they understand me. Best review I've ever gotten. <clears throat> From Tommy. I really liked your book and I liked the character who was Danny Hupfer. He was brave and courageous. I wish I could be like Danny Hupfer. Don't you want to know his story? I'm going to go past here. Dear Mr. Schmidt, <clears throat> I like your style of writing because you, you use a lot of beautiful. <laughs> I hope that's right, right? Like it feels like it's missing a word, but I hope that's what, it just, what he meant to say. You use a lot of beautiful. I also like how you use personification. Here's one I wrote. The wind tapping me on the shoulder as it felt as cold as a ghost. And here's one of my favorite lines from any letter ever, any time. Your books make me feel like I can do anything. Yeah, you'd, you'd go back to your desk after that one, right? <clears throat> to get letters like those is, uh, well, I think you can imagine. Uh, what I want to talk about tonight for a bit and muse with you, as long as my voice stays with me, um, is to, why is it that we think, that we believe that books are important for us? And I know that sounds like such an obvious question, but we live in strange times when even basic questions seem to be overturned or given strange answers. And it seems to me that every so often that it's not a bad idea just to sit back for a little bit and start to think about, well, why, why should we have books? Why should there be a library? It takes a lot of money. All that time in English classes, um, why should we do it? And I sort of want to muse about that for a little while with you, if that's OK. And I'm going to start in a sort of strange place. About a year ago, I was at a graduation at Handlin Prison in Ionia County, Michigan. Handlin is a maximum security prison where I was teaching. I've taught it Tuesday nights for four years there. It is a maximum security prison. It takes 45 very intensive minutes to get through security. Most of the guys I teach are lifers. They are never leaving these prisons. They were graduating on this day into an associate's degree. I began to work at Hanlon Prison, <clears throat> mostly because of a guy named John Rotman, who was a chaplain there. The year before, I had lost my wife to cancer. And between then and the day that John called me, I had canceled all speaking and all writing gigs. I'd stopped all writing. There just wasn't any point anymore. <clears throat> and John called to ask if I would come and speak to the 28 guys who had read some of my books. And I said, no, I wasn't interested. In, and I said, I just don't do this anymore. And John, because he's a wise guy, says to me, Gary, it's been a year. It's time to get back in the game. And I was furious. I was beside myself with anger that someone would dare to say something like that to me. <coughs> but I also trusted John, and so I went to the prison. If you've never been to a prison, particularly a maximum security one, it's hard for me to describe this to you. I sat through the orientation, which was filled with dire warnings. Never turn your back on these guys. Never let them get behind you. Never, 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 never let them touch you. Never touch them. Never use anything but their last names. Never let the panic button that you're wearing leave your side. And there's a panic button that you wore on, on your belt. When all that was done, on one January night, I went to the prison <clears throat> for the first time. The guys were late. 
They'd been in lockdown all day because the guards had been finding so many knives. They'd spent their day in their underwear, and supper that night had been a piece of bread with a slice of American cheese on it and a swath of mustard. When I heard that, waiting for the guys to come, I thought these guys would come into this room with me and they'd be, you know, mad. They'd be angry. But when the first guy came in, his name was David, he looked at me and he said, no kidding. You can't believe what a blessing it is you're here tonight. First thing a lifer had ever said to me, you can't believe what a blessing it is that you're here tonight. The talk and discussion <clears throat> was supposed to go for 45 minutes. It went for two hours until one of the guards knocked on the glass outside. And when we had to leave, one of the guys, his name was John Shank, no kidding, John Shank. He asked me, <clears throat> so how often do you get into the word? I was a little bit surprised. How often do you get into the word? It's not often that you'd be asked that question by someone in jail. And I decided to be completely honest with him. I told him about Henry David Thoreau on his deathbed, how he was approached by a conquered minister who said to him, Henry, have you made your peace with God? And Thoreau replied, I wasn't aware that we'd quarreled. Great line. I hope it's true. <clears throat> I tried to tell these guys about Anne, but I could hardly speak it. And as it turned out, the chaplain had already told them, and they knew, and I said, God and I have quarreled. And they looked at me in perfect understanding. We all knew what it was to quarrel with God. We'd all done it. Some of us were still doing it. It was amazing. But they weren't done with their amazement, at least for me. We have something for you, says John Shank. Again, I'm a little surprised. What could they possibly have for me? I mean, they haven't been out shopping. What could it possibly be? And they all stood up, <clears throat> and they came to the front of the room. They surrounded me, front and back. They were all touching me. I was a little bit concerned. <laughs> and meanwhile, I had left my panic button in my coat on the table over here, and, and I had done it purposely because I was ashamed to wear it. It made me look afraid, at least I thought it made me look afraid, or perhaps that I didn't trust them. So I didn't have the panic button. And you know what they gave me? They prayed for me. These guys, murderers, murderers and rapists and drug dealers, now surrounding me, holding me, they prayed for me. You cannot know what it's like to have a murderer pray for you because you've lost so much. Last May at this graduation, <clears throat> the main commencement speaker was okay. You know, commencement speakers, right? <clears throat> but to my mind, he was well overshadowed by a student respondent whose name was Anthony, who spoke of the ways in which taking classes and reading books had taught him to think deeply and to try and act with justice. I wish you could have heard it. Anthony was articulate, organized, powerful, <laughs> devout, he had told me before the commencement started <clears throat> that there was a surprise he had planned during the talk, and I have to confess, that made me a little nervous. You don't want surprises in a maximum security prison where the guys toting the guns are ready to use them so eagerly. But at the end of the talk, this is what Anthony had in mind, he and the other 18 graduates stood up and defined each one in a few words the nature of the community that had come together in this prison to allow each of them to flourish in a university program. I wish you could have heard that too. Perhaps I was the most amazed person in the room <clears throat> because I was Anthony's first teacher at Hanlon where I taught the enhancement class. And that's the group of students who want to be in the college program but who lack the reading and writing and critical skills to succeed there, mostly because of years of abuse and neglect and little education. In that early class, the first ones I had with him, he could read, kinda. He could write, kinda. He was not even vaguely close to a college class. In class, he never spoke, <clears throat> even if I asked him something directly. But he worked like a dog. He was desperate to learn. He was desperate to read. Here's the world Anthony comes from. When he was nine years old, 
<clears throat> Anthony left his apartment in the projects of New York City and went to make a drug deal for his parents. He's nine. When he came back, his parents took the drugs and went into their bedroom. And since he knew he wouldn't see them again the rest of the day, he decided not to go to school, but instead he sat down and put on the TV. And when he did, the picture that came up that morning was the first <clears throat> burning tower in New York City. He watched, fascinated, and then the second plane hit. Anthony went outside. He searched the skies for the plane that might hit his apartment house. He was writing this in a memoir for the class, and I thought after reading that line, this is how it must have been in New York, that people came out to see if there were other planes coming to hit other buildings. And there's Anthony watching for that. But that wasn't what he was actually saying. <clears throat> Instead, Anthony wrote this. I went outside to see if another plane was going to hit my apartment building. I wish there would be. It would do me a favor. His parents were upstairs. Anthony was nine when he was wishing there would be. Nine. At the end of that first semester together, he came up to the front of the classroom and quietly said, we read 11 books. Yeah, 11, I said. I was just glad to hear him talk. That's more books than I've read my entire life, he said. Terrific, I said. That's a fantastic accomplishment, and it was. Anthony waited for a moment, and then he said this. And librarians out there, please remember this line. If I had had these books when I was a kid, he said, then, and he didn't finish. I think everyone in this room can finish for him, though. If I had had these books when I was a kid, then. A year later, <clears throat> Anthony stopped me one night in the hall to tell me he'd been accepted into the BA program. I know, I said. That's fantastic. He was overjoyed. I'm the first person in my family to get to college, he said. And you know what? I did it while I was in prison. Pretty cool, huh? Then last fall, <clears throat> after I had passed through all the security and was walking down the long hall toward class on Tuesday night, two prisoners stopped me, guys I didn't know, and they knew me. And they both say, do you hear about Anthony? They asked. Now, in a high security prison, that question, did you hear about, is almost always followed by disaster. And my heart stopped. Did you hear about? But it wasn't disaster this time. It was about Anthony's philosophy class, how his professor had returned written essays to his class at the end of the night, but he kept Anthony's to the very end. And his professor had told the class at that moment that Anthony's paper was a model piece of academic writing. And he had stopped everyone from leaving and said, I'm going to read it to you and he read Anthony's essay aloud to the whole class. In prison, being singled out like that can get you beat up to within an inch of your life. But the two guys telling me this, they were proud of him. They were wicked proud of him. That night, they nicknamed him Turtle. I have no idea why, <clears throat> but he became Turtle. And as I drove home that night after seeing him and congratulating him, I just cried the whole way home, which was pr pretty much true after every night at Hanlon Prison. Anthony remains in prison, but he's not the guy he was when he committed his crime. Since that crime, he has not seen his two children, who were babies at the time. They're now 17. At the graduation, they were supposed to come to the prison to meet their father for the first time. But at the very last minute, their mother pulled them back. So Anthony, right now, is still in prison, still waiting to see them, still reading, and now being a tutor. I'm working, I'm trying to work on all that, said Anthony, so I can be, I, so I can be what I'm supposed to be for them, he said to me. What do books do for us? What do stories do for us? They save our lives. They save our lives. My own family was a collection of storytellers. Not so much writers, but storytellers. On my father's side, this was super uneasy. Like many German families, their stories always began, always began at World War II. 
and the immigrant years before then were the kind of years we do not speak of, mostly because of their uncomfortable relationship with Germany. I heard very little about my father's childhood or about his father's life and certainly about his grandfather's life. The early stories I did hear were always abrupt and truncated. I remember tidbits of the story of my great-grandfather renouncing his Prussian citizenship and then skedaddling to America. He had to be out of the boundaries of the country within 24 hours. I heard the beginning of my story about my grandfather walking across, to the, across the street to his parents' home in Flushing, New York in 1939, just after the invasion of Poland, and of him taking down the pictures of his father's nieces and nephews, his cousins, who were wearing their Hitler Youth uniforms, and my grandfather announcing that that side of the family, quote, was dead to us now. I remember my father talking about a kid on their block who answered the call to, to return to Germany to fight in the German army for the Second World War, and whose mother, now left alone by her only son, lived on, on their block, with drawn curtains forever afterwards. When that boy was killed, no one on the block knew how to comfort her, or even if they should comfort the mother of a traitor, or at least someone des designated as a traitor. There was no gold star. There was nothing for him. On my father's side, stories of the war mattered hugely. <clears throat> when we drove into New York City to visit Uncle Mal and Aunt Millie, my father and Uncle Mal would quickly move past my father's bank job and Uncle Mal's job as a librarian and get what to what counted. Those days in the war, when Mal was in the army and stationed on Guam, and my father was in the Navy and stationed on a supply ship. Here's the story that stayed with me best. Mal was responsible for knowing the current positions of all ships in the Pacific theater. The officer above him once told him that if they were suddenly overwhelmed by the enemy, the first thing he'd do was to go shoot Mal in the head. It was a joke, Mal thought, until he realized it wasn't. So one morning, Mal saw that my father's ship was coming into a supply to supply a unit on Guam. And Mal decided that he would go meet my, meet my father, as my father must have hoped too. On that day, they hadn't seen each other for well over a year. So Mal did everything he could to requisition a Jeep. And when that failed, he stole a bicycle and began to cycle across the island. Uncle Mal was not, and I'm being very kind here, an athletic man. When I knew him, I could hardly imagine him on a bike at all. Nonetheless, he cycled like a madman, he said, across the island, and finally came to the port on the eastern side, arriving at the docks just in time to see my father's ship heading out to sea. He said that for the only time during the war, he stood on the dock and wept and wept. They'd often tell this story together, back and forth, back and forth, and then they would look at each other and laugh like horses, like horses, and then they'd stop because in the end, it wasn't really a funny story. Afterwards, I used to think of Mal on the dock, watching the retreating ship in the distance. I would think of my father stationed in the forecastle, unsure that Mal had even known he was on the island, wishing he had known, wishing he had seen him. I thought of Mal biking back across all of Guam, alone and lonely, everything for naught. Even as a kiddo, <clears throat> that story was an emblem for me of what it meant to be apart, to be lonely, to be cut off by circumstances that you're not responsible for, and yet that controlled you completely. I guess it was a story that seemed, even for a young kiddo, to epitomize what it meant to be mortal. On my mother's side, things were much more writerly. My uncle's name was Bradford Ernest Smith, and though I doubt very much anyone here knows that name, perhaps some of you will know his work. Before Sesame Street, there were a number of live shows for kids. Remember when television was still live? Shows that were aimed at a child audience, and one of those was Captain Kangaroo. Anyone remember? Kangaroo. Captain Kangaroo. <clears throat> My uncle wrote that show. He wrote it in CBS during its early years. The show extended for, watch this, 6,000 performances over 29 years. If you don't know the show, alas, you probably have a much poorer life for it, but that's okay. It was a pastiche of cartoons and music and skits and educational bits, all featuring, of course, the captain, who wore something like a naval uniform. No one ever knew what it was, really. He had a mustache and a bull haircut, and he was 
to use a kind of outdated term, he was jolly. I mean, that's kind of what you think of him. His best companion was, anyone remember? Mr. Green Jeans, <clears throat> who was an actor who presented as a kind of hayseed farmer. And Mr. Moose, remember him? It was a puppet with outsized you know, moose antlers. He was always a step or two behind the joke. And there was some other animal in costume with a big round mouth. I think his name was Cosmo, I don't remember. Who had a large, he had this large round mouth, but he never spoke. The stick that played on most of the shows was this tremendous shower of ping pong balls that would come down all over the place at some sort of moment of crisis in the skits. And I used to wonder as a kiddo how the captain and Mr. Green Jeans and maybe my uncle would ever be able to pick up all those ping pong balls, hundreds, from the set and have them ready for the next show. You can't believe how much cachet there was when I was in kindergarten and first grade and second grade. And I was related to the guy who was riding Captain Kangaroo. You can't believe how cool that was. It wasn't quite so cool in high school, but it was really cool in first grade. <clears throat> I remember a show when the captain came on to tell us that one of the minor characters who appeared from time to time had passed away. That is, the actor who played that character had died. I was a little older then. I remember thinking how easy it would have been to simply have someone else play the character, no explanation necessary. Or how simple it would have been to just eliminate him from the show. He doesn't show up anymore. But the captain, who was crying, live television, came on to tell the children who were listening the story of this actor's life and his work with the show and how he had gotten ill and how he had died and how he had left people behind. The captain talked about sadness, about his sadness, but also about how the day would come when Mr. Moose would be back on in Cosmo, the ping pong balls would fall again. I felt as a kid at that moment respected. I felt I was being told a very important story by someone who trusted me to understand why the story of that man was important, and not just another skit I was watching while I ate my Lucky Charms. I think as a writer, I begin there with the stories of my past, with what they gave me, with what they still give me, power, trust, a belief in, in the capacity of a kid to get it. Stories, good stories, give what Aristotle, let's may as well go here, right? <clears throat> Called recognition. It gives us recognition. And though when he used that term, he's talking about the characters in which we see portions of ourselves. I think it's still within the framework of his thought to say it's recognition about the nature of the world. Stories move us in that we experience in them what the world is like. Aristotle says we should read a story and be able to say, ah. That's how the world really is. And when we respond that way, we're not just affirming it's imitating the world, we're affirming the powerful community of a reader and writer and teller who in that moment of connection are looking at the world together and perhaps they're affirming it or denying it or some other way, but in that moment they are staring at the world together in perfect communion. When I sit at my typewriter alone, except for the border collie, that's what I try for. And there's more. It's not just recognition. A few years ago, <clears throat> I brought a group of college students up to Stratford, Ontario, to see several plays as part of the annual Shakespeare Festival there. One of the plays is always a musical, which I have to confess, I'm never excited about. I don't really like musicals all that sudden breaking in into the middle of a song in the middle of a crisis. It always makes me want to, you know, laugh. But we went to see Man of La Mancha. On this trip was an English major who was very interested in theater. She came, brought with her her very eager boyfriend, who was an engineer, who was not very eager to learn about theater, who was not interested at all in theater, who could care less about theater, but who was very, very interested in her. And he came along on that motivation alone. We do this trip on a very tight budget. So the tickets were, you know, shall we say, the cheap seats way at the top of seventh heaven here. And it turned out that that English major and her engineering boyfriend <clears throat> randomly got the tickets for the show at the very, very top of the theater. 
I mean, you really almost needed a telescope. The engineering major didn't care as he settled in beside her. He's fully aware of his motivation, probably she was too, for coming and eager for the privacy. But the engineering major was re really did care when a moment later, I came down and sat right next to them, that I was in the third seat, that he was not happy, as you can again imagine. I thought it was a delightful coincidence, though it was pretty weird. At the end of the play, after Don Quixote's adventures and misadventures, his family discovers him, and they force him to come home. And if you've seen the play, you'll remember the scene. And Don Quixote lies on what is clearly his deathbed. And the family tries to force him to give up this ridiculous identity that he's taken on. There's no Don Quixote. And he, they want him to finally speak his real family name. What is your name, they insist. What is your real name, he says, Don Quixote. No, what is your real name? Speak it. And they demand it. They want this moment when he's clearly who he should be. <clears throat> and the engineering major beside me, this guy who had not interested in the theater, in the, up in the seventh heaven of this vast theater. No kidding. He leans forward in his seat. He looks down on the stage. He's watching this all happen. And he whispers, say Don Quixote. Tell them, tell them it's Don Quixote. But he doesn't. At that moment, the character yields and he speaks his family name instead. And this engineering major next to me sat back against the seat with this terrible sigh of disappointment. I tell you the truth. At that moment, I would have done all the work that I had put into that trip just for him and him alone so that he could be pierced with true story as he was, so that he could experience that piercing and learn what art can do. And it doesn't matter that the musical, because it's kind of a stupid musical, <clears throat> ends with Don Quixote standing up, he's supposed to be on his deathbed, and eventually reasserting his imagined identity. He claims to be the Lord of La Mancha again. This engineering, engineering major had already seen it, the terrible brokenness of a world without charity, without imagination, without humanity. He had seen it, and he knew it was a true seeing, and he was changed. A few months ago, a student of mine pointed me towards a book I didn't know about, David Foster Wallace's This is Water. Anyone know that book? This is Water. When the student told me it was short, I was sure he was mistaken, since David Foster Wallace had no idea how to write a short anything. But the student was right. It is short. And it opens with this really, really quick anecdote, which perhaps some of you have heard before. Here's the anecdote that the book opens with. There were these two young fish swimming along, and they happened to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what's water? We live in a culture, <clears throat> and you all know this, that is powerful, that is controlling, that is dominant, that is absolutely insistent upon itself. And its greatest power, our culture's greatest power, comes from the fact that it doesn't announce itself. We hardly know it's there. We don't know we're swimming in water because we are so accepted. Of course this is the way it is. Story tells us that the water is there. Story questions the water. Story calls us to pay attention to the water. Story insists we pay attention because story often tells us what it means to live in the culture we live in and to see its effects. In heightened experience, it wakes us up. It offers possibilities. We can respond more passionately, more wisely, more fully to the world around us because we have had an encounter with the arts. And this is why the loss of a vigorous support for the arts in colleges and universities across North America, and the suspicion that has grown in the last few years about librarians and libraries is so frighteningly self-destructive. When our culture insists that we consume, 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 when our culture preaches not self-reliance, but self-absorption 
and self-investment. When our culture focuses us on the banal and the trivial. When our culture suggests that a story about a TikTok personality should be given the same level of significance and attention as a report on the loss of an entire ecosystem. When our culture um, <clears throat> projects and protect, protects a social media universe whose workings are, let's just say it, whose workings are purposefully obscene and obviously destructive of communities and individuals and often manipulated to no good purpose. When all that happens, story begs us to pay attention to the individual, to the community, to every complex and striving soul in our midst who is loved by God and shaped by God and held in the palm of the Lord's hand against the onslaught of a broken world. We see this in the ways that stories offer us avenues of response. And I find that when I am most moved by story, I am moved by these offered avenues, particularly when that avenue is filled with grace. The Ethiopian writer Mirren Hedero has a recent short story called The Suitcase. It tells of Saba, who has come to the city of Addis Ababa to visit relatives. She has brought two suitcases with her, one filled with what she needs over the next few weeks, <clears throat> the other filled with gifts from family in the United States. It's a heady visit for her. She opens channels between hard to bridge worlds. She begins to learn the language, to understand and live in the country of her family's history. The living is exciting, rambunctious, a little frightening. But Saba begins to get a sense of how important her heritage is to her. Her Ethiopian family sees this growth and this budding love and they have seen this before, and it didn't go so well. A relative, come, a relative comes, enjoys a limited and recreational stay, then goes back to America with all that it offers, and they never hear from the person again. They're a bit resigned to having this happen with Saba. When it comes time to leave, Saba packs, <clears throat> and then is asked to bring out the one empty suitcase so that her Ethiopian family can fill it with the gifts they want to send back to the United States. The problem is, there is no way that all that they want to send back with Saba will fit into this suitcase, no matter how they pack it and stuff it and negotiate the space. So the question becomes, whose gifts will Saba take back? This, as you can imagine, leads to huge fights over who gets to send their gift. And so time passes, and it's time to leave for the airport. And then it's past time to leave for the airport. And then it's really past time to leave for the airport. And the tension in the air is enormous. Guess what they do? Saba walked to the suitcase she had packed herself, filled it with her own things, and in one quick gesture, emptied the, context, uh, the contents. Her best clothes fell to the floor, her favorite old jeans, her most sophisticated dresses, her one polished blazer a new pair of rain boots, t-shirts collected from concerts and trips and old relationships. She pushed the empty suitcase to the center of the room. Friends, my dear neighbors, my dear relatives, she said in Forrest and Harrick, looking at the confused expressions on their faces. Please watch this line. Now there's room for all. There were gasps, whispers, whistles, an inexplicable loud thud, no laughter. Are you sure? This is the least I can do, Saba said slowly. It is the least I can do. What about your belongings, Fossil asked. We'll keep them safe for her in case she returns, Conscience said, her voice commanding the space. Until she returns, Rahul corrected. Until you return, Conscience asked. And Saba said, yes. This open suitcase is Saba's affirmation of her family's love, her affirmation that this is not over for her, she has changed. She's grown into a new heritage. <clears throat> no one doubts she'll be back. That is what identification and grace look like, the story says. And then the story also says, reader, how do you respond? In 1872, <coughs> John Ruskin published a collected works edition of all his writings. It's a beautiful set, blue leather, compartmentalized spine, gilt edges all the way around. I bought it out of guilt, with a U, myself, because I had read his stuff in college and I hated it. 
And I thought it would be kind of fair just to kind of give it another go. So I have to admit, I still hate it. It hasn't taken for me. <clears throat> and he has, he has one essay, which is so cleverly entitled Lecture 3. And he gasses on about the relationship between art and science and gasses on and gasses on. He just keeps, oh, it's awful. And then suddenly he stops. It's almost like someone slapped him. And it's like he leans forward right out of the book. And he says, as if he suddenly thought of this important thing, this critical thing, this thing he has to share. He says this, there is nothing that I tell you with more eager desire that you should believe, nothing with wider ground in my experience for requiring you to believe, he says, than this. You will never love art well till you love what she mirrors better. And of course, what art mirrors is the world. You will never love art until you love the world. I like that. I think I would change it a little bit. I think I would say you will love art and story well as they reveal and offer to you ways to respond to what art mirrors the world. Because that's what story does. We're moved by stories because it offers us a way to respond to the world. <clears throat> So let me end with this challenge to you. And for all writers who live in a broken world, tonight or tomorrow, go home and write up the story of that woman in Flushing, New York in 1944 who lives behind drawn curtains. She lives alone. Her beloved son, who spent his childhood playing with the kids up and down the block, has followed what he thought was his duty to go back and fight on the German side. He is a traitor to everyone this woman knows. And though she has not gone back, no one from the block now speaks to her. No one stops and knocks at her door. No one offers to help her carry the groceries. No one invites her to sit on the stoop with them as evening comes on. On Sundays, she huddles in the back pew of St. Paul's Lutheran and leaves before the final prayer so no one will see her. And this morning, she got the telegram she has feared all along. It has announced her son's death while fighting for his country. And though there are gold stars in some of the windows up and down the block, there will not be one in hers. Think of that woman retroactively. And then write the story because you love the world and all of its brokenness. How does story move us? Why does story move us? That's how. Write that story, and that's why. Robert Bolt writes this of Sir Thomas More, or in the words of, of Sir Thomas More, God made the angels to show him splendor, and he made the animals for innocence and plants for their simplicity. But man, he made to serve him wittily in the tangles of his mind. The writer, the reader, are always in the tangles of our minds. Thank you, folks, for coming tonight. May the Lord bless and keep you all. Someone uh, who couldn't be here tonight, Gary, um, sent this. As a fan of both your writing and that of William Shakespeare, I've always enjoyed how you found ways to relate Shakespeare's plays to the current day life of Holling Hood Hood in the Wednesday Wars. Uh, she wonders, what was your first Shakespeare play and did you read it or see it performed? How old were you and did you enjoy it immediately or was it something that grew on you? <laughs> um, boy, that's hard to go back there, right? I think one of the earliest ones I ever saw was Macbeth, <clears throat> which has lots of blood and violence. So, you know, you're eight years old. It's fantastic, right? <clears throat> I mean, all this stuff going on. It was also set in colonial Africa so that um, Macbeth was one of the you know, imperialists there. And it was so cool because the actors, I should say the, the, the whole performance, really wanted to give you the sense that you were in, I think it was Kenya. And at the end, when um, Macduff's sons come out, 
to try and overtake Macbeth and the big fight ensues. They came onto the stage in a Jeep, no kidding, in a Jeep. And the odd thing of it, um, I was super young. The very first car that I ever drove was a Jeep. And I was about eight or nine, um, but it was before that play. And it was my Sunday school teacher who had a Jeep and he had a field in the back. And he took, he let us drive his Jeep. I mean, it's just crazy. And I just could imagine myself coming onto that stage in a Jeep and thinking that was wicked cool. And I think what I really liked about it, though I don't always like plays that are out of period, what I liked about it was just the spectacle. And of course, Shakespeare's great at that. He wants it to be a spectacle. Um, it's not just a story. It's just this astonishing experience on stage. On stage. And if you think about what it must have been like back then, um, when you're standing the whole time, I mean, you're standing for three hours if you're watching a Shakespeare play back at the period, and the best seats are right against the stage where you can put your arms like this and support yourself. But other than that, you're standing for three hours on the, that lowest level. Spectacle has got to happen. You have to be engaged. And so it wasn't so much in those early, in that first play, that I cared about the story or that I even cared or understood much of what was going on. It was just this, look what's happening on stage. How incredible is that? The witches, I mean, the sword fights. I just loved it all. I loved that. So I think I would say that. And of course, that's probably a false memory, right? I was so young, who knows what it was fully like. But when I think of that time, that's what I think of. And I still, when I go see um, a Shakespeare play today, I love, I love just the spectacle of it, perhaps even more than the story at times, to see how you take a play that's, you know, 400 years old and make it so engaging in a culture which we, where we depend on the visual so powerfully. To watch how an actor does it, I just still find it wonderful. Yeah, excuse me. I loved your um, story of uh, your accounts of teaching in the prison. Um, as a teacher myself, um, I always uh, really appreciate the kind of feedback similar to that I've got from my students. I've never had yeah. them circle around me and pray for me. Um, but um, uh, just that uh, environment that you find yeah. yourself in, that's, you know, I can... I can identify with that. Are you still teaching there? No, and one of the great disappointments of my life, um, that enhancement program has been canceled, and instead they, they just keep the college program. So that's still there, and I'm glad about that. But I argued that the guys who needed it most were the guys who had never had, they weren't even, there's no chance of getting into a college program until you take that other one. And the argument back to me was, well, it's costly. And so we're just gonna start with people who can make it. And I get that understanding, I can see it, money, money, I suppose, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the goal is to help each one of these guys to graduate, and then they're taken out of that prison and they're brought to new prisons and they then are the seeds for instructors for other guys. So we'll grow through the Michigan system. It's a really exciting program but the program I was invested in um, is now over. I don't know, you know, I just finished teaching a month and a half ago. I now have the space to do it again. Maybe I'll just start with that college program and accept that, but I really do. And this is gonna sound strange. It was really hard to leave that program. It was really hard to leave those guys. And I think we became close. And though a lot of people say, did you feel safe? Yeah, of course I felt safe. And I know, and maybe you had the same experience, I know that if one of those guys had gotten off his meds, say, and came at me, or if there was some argument and I had to stand between them, I have absolutely no doubt that the other 26 guys in that prison would have risen up and would have protected me. I, I don't, it's not even a, a thought. I never wore the panic button because I believe they would take care of me. And I really think it was some of the best teaching I had in my life. I think it's also just instructive if, um, if you've never been in a prison, <clears throat> you cannot go there and walk through the yard and notice that you are probably 
one of the very few, if not the only white guy in that in sight. You cannot teach there for very long without realizing how incredibly broken the system is or the incredible injustices that are gonna go on. Um, had a guy, Raphael, <clears throat> who was an artist, went through the semester, finished the program, graduated, and he had a pretty good, the warden there was pretty progressive. So he had brought in a dog program so that the certain guys could then teach guys, instruct guys on how to do a, what's that called when you have a dog that takes care of, of you? Uh, yeah, so, I don't think it's therapy. Well, anyway, the, the dog that serves you if you need, if you're in a wheelchair, say. Um, and Raphael is across the yard, <clears throat> and it's a huge yard. And I'm walking over to the classroom, and Raphael calls, he's got his dog, he calls me and he goes, let me show you, Mr. Schmidt, let me show you. And so I start to walk over there. And the guard who's walking with me, because I had to have a guard, that was policy. The guard who's walking with me says to me in this low voice, make him come to you. You know, <laughs> there's no necessity for that. And I said to him, I'm his teacher, I'm not his guard. And he looked at me with this complete disdain, like, what a jerk you are. But I walked over to Raphael, he walked to me, he showed me his dog, he showed me some of the tricks that he'd been teaching him, but also the important things. And then he, um, <clears throat> then we had to part, and the guard, when I got back to him, because he'd been waiting the whole time, would not speak to me. He just thought I was a complete jerk. Raphael is pardoned by the governor of Michigan. He had been in there for a 25-year prison sentence for his very first violation of carrying a certain amount of marijuana, 25 years. When he got to the outskirts, or to, to the gate, when he's about to leave Hanlon Prison, his family is driven from Chicago and they are waiting for him so they can bring him back to Chicago. And of course, can you imagine the joy? I mean, can you imagine? But ICE is also waiting. And he walks out the gate and there's a white van and Immigration officers come, and they take him, no word spoken. He's put in the back of an unmarked white van, and he finds himself the next day in Haiti. Okay. <laughs> no matter what you think about immigration, and I know you guys have to think about it a lot, no one, I think, can look at that and say, yeah, that's justice. So and I don't think you can be there very long without feeling without learning that any assumptions that you've had about the prison system and the guys who show up there are all valid. And the guys that I met, one guy was in there for, he was at 17 when he committed murder. <clears throat> his name was Lamont. He had just gotten a gun with his first um, salary, his first check. And he had gone to a party and gotten angry and he killed a guy. Okay. But he's 17. He's now 43, or when I met him, he was 43. All that time had gone by. He was in prison for life. If he walked in here, you would think, this is the most gentle man I've ever met. He's completely gentle. The first book he ever read was the one in my classroom. He came up afterwards and said, I read that whole book first time. I, you know, what do you say to that? You just cry. <laughs> Uh, when the United States Supreme Court declared that anyone given a life sentence, um, this happened about eight or 10 years ago, um, when anyone given a life sentence at the age of 17 must be available for parole, um, cruel and unusual punishment, Lamont was that guy, life sentence at age 17. But it didn't mean that that happens automatically. And Lamont had no resources, no family, no one to take care. <clears throat> there was no way he was gonna get the lawyer that would help him get out. Five years went by. He was supposed to be pardoned. Five dang years. Anyway, yeah, you learn a lot. And it was great teaching. Questions, comments, protest. We'll we'll have to, we have time for one more, couple more questions. And then it's book signing. And I like questions from our young guest. I feel honored. Uh, 
why cream puffs in the Wednesday Wars? Are you fond of cream puffs or is it just random? Uh, Good question. I, yeah. <clears throat> when I was 13, I went to a friend's bar mitzvah and I sat next to Sean Casey. So here's this, you know, Gary Schmidt, about as Protestant as you're going to get. Sean Casey, who's Catholic and we're at a bar mitzvah. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, most of my friends were Jewish and so there were a lot of bar mitzvahs and I loved them. You ate really, really well. And so um, Sean and I had eaten super well at this, I guess it was a breakfast. Um, and we were really, really full. And this guy came with a tray, they rolled a tray of uh, chocolate eclairs, which I kind of loved. And he brings them over to our table and he goes, take as many as you want. Oh my gosh, take as many as you want. We were so full that I looked at Sean and he looked at me and I go, I'm gonna throw up if I eat these. It's just not gonna happen. Sean looks at me and he nods, and then he says, you know what? We will remember for the rest of our lives that we did not take this chocolate eclair. And it's true. <laughs> I have never forgotten that I didn't take that chocolate eclair. So in that scene, I was thinking of chocolate eclairs, but I wasn't sure that people would know what they were. Um, and I'm not sure if that's even true. Maybe everyone would know what they are but I thought I should choose something that's a little bit more um, common. And so I converted the, I converted, I changed the chocolate eclairs to um, cream puffs just because I thought people would know about them um, that way. And that's, that's really how they got into the book. Since then, you cannot believe, you cannot believe, you cannot believe how many schools I go to and at the end of the event, <clears throat> they will say, we have a surprise for you. <laughs> and I go, oh, what could that possibly be? <laughs> and they say, well, it's a surprise. And then someone will go out, and then they will wheel in on a cart, you know, cream puffs. And they're always the frozen ones, and they have never been dethought. And so I will say, oh my, what a surprise. And they will say, isn't it? And then they will hand out all these cream puffs and I have to kind of do my crummy acting and say, oh, I'm so thrilled at this because I'm sort of sick to cream puff, of cream puffs, actually. <clears throat> but yeah, that's how they started. You just convert it to what you think is going to be best for the book, pretty much. One last question, comment, protest. Okay, a young lady, okay. While I'm walking down there, I can say that as a former teacher, one of the biggest joys is when the student, the first half of the semester, acts like they can't, they don't want to be there. And the second half of the semester, they love being there. Yeah. Pretty cool. Have you ever had a teacher that you thought that they hated your guts, like Holling and Miss Baker? That's good a good question. question. That's a really good question. Um, in the book, Holling is wrong about Mrs. Baker. He thinks she doesn't like him. Um, he thinks that she's really against him. And little by little, it's revealed that she really does like him. I mean, she goes and lights the candles eventually in, the, in that one church. And she's always liked him, but she's also the teacher. And there's a difference between a friend and a teacher. It's not the same thing. And so here's this teacher who really cares about him and is, um, respects him and believes in him, <clears throat> and um, he only discovers that as the story moves along, moves along. Really, the last lines with her are really a kind of admission that he gets it. He gets that she's looking at, thinking about him. Um, she kind of has a sense of his life and what his life is gonna go towards, and it's because she cares about him so much. It's such a positive thing. Now, the real Mrs. Baker, who was my teacher, um, was not that. And in, uh, in real life, what happened is in sixth grade, everyone would leave who was Jewish at 1.30, and then everyone who was Lutheran or Catholic would leave at 1.45. And in my class, in my school, in fact, in sixth grade, I was the only one that was left behind because I wasn't Jewish, Lutheran, or Catholic. And Mrs. Baker was my teacher, and she was really ticked because all the other sixth grade teachers, they left. You know, by two o'clock, they're all gone but not her. 
And so she had to stay in the classroom with me, and, um, and I think she resented it. So we did not have a good relationship, <clears throat> to say the least. And I really have had amazing and wonderful, incredible teachers, but um, she, she wasn't one of them. Um, and I feel badly about that, but it's, uh, she did give me the character. So, okay, at least there was that. And, but I never saw her after I left. Um, but I had other great teachers. Um, in the book, there's a mention of a Miss Kavikoff, and she was in fourth grade, and she sort of saved me because I had been tracked. Um, that meant that you were put in certain categories, and I was put in the stupid category. We all knew that's what it was. And she taught the smartest kids. And she met me on the playground. I met her. We liked each other. And she came into the stupid classroom. And she said, Gary, get your stuff. I had no idea how it happened. Neither did my parents, who didn't know about it. But she came in. I picked, took the stuff out of my desk. And we went to her classroom. I was in fourth grade. I had not learned how to read. And she taught me how to read. And I will, I'm the only reason I'm here is because Ms. Kavikov came in that day and brought me to her classroom. Um, it's probably not the case when you are my age. I know how unimaginably far that seems to you. It's probably not the case that you'll be writing to your fourth grade teacher, but I do. She lives in Israel, you can imagine right now, in the northern kibbutz <clears throat> within sight of the northern border. So I think about her a lot. And she and I write once a month, my fourth grade teacher. Her name is Mrs. Block now. Her husband has passed away. She was a great teacher. Um, so I, someday I'll write about her. Um, but Mrs. Baker was not that person. Is that a question? <clears throat> oh, <laughs> you have a question. OK. <coughs> See, this is like the auction house. You raise your hand, you bought it. Yeah, you buy, <laughs> you buy a moose head. So you were you wrote this like during the Vietnam War. What was it like, like um, being in school and hearing about that? Um, yeah, the book is set, yeah the book is set during the Vietnam War. Um, it was terrifying, um, and in a way, it was sort of like that anecdote about the fish. It was in the water, but we hardly knew um, anything else. And the difference was that during those years. It was always in our faces. So on the news every night, you would see live pictures or recently done pictures of the battles. I mean, they were right in your face. We all knew someone who was fought in the war. We all knew someone who was at the war. Many of us knew um, someone in the war who'd been killed. Um, I did. And it was, it was really terrifying because you thought it would go on forever. It didn't seem like there was an end game it didn't seem like anyone wanted there to be an end game. And we all knew that at age 18, we were going to be drafted on the guys. <clears> or <throat> we were sure that that would happen. And so, yeah, I mean, I sat with my brother when he was older than me, and he went through the draft because it's done on TV. No kidding. And it was terrifying. I mean, to watch his fate being decided by a guy in Washington, D.C., that was just completely random. Today, it's not so utterly different. Um, we have been in war, at war, constantly. There's never been a moment for a high schooler who can, who can say, I, this was a day when there was no war. We don't have that. It's constant. The difference is that it's no longer on TV, or not so much. It's no longer in our faces. We don't have people being drafted, which terrifyingly might change in the next three or four years. No kidding. And so it feels like <clears throat> the experience of a middle schooler today is different from me only because of exposure, but not necessarily because of where we are in terms of how we live in a broken world. That's one of the reasons why Wednesday Wars was written. I could talk about Vietnam because it's so explicit and obvious, but in many ways I'm talking about today. And it doesn't matter if you're on the right or the left. What matters is to recognize that that is constant powerful na international and national stories um, cross our minds when we're that young. And it's not like we dwell on them necessarily, but they touch us and they, we move on. 
And so all the ones that you just mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm around 11 when that's happening. And I remember sort of being touched by it, but not, obviously not getting all the, the ramifications of that. But there's still parts of our lives and they somehow um, affect what, the way we're thinking and the way we're acting. And for me, behind all those, or maybe mixed with all of those, was of course Vietnam, probably for you too. <clears throat> and so the whole time that's all going on, I'm also thinking, dang, you know, I'm 11, 12, 14, 16, the war is dragging on, the war is dragging on, the war is dragging on. Nixon is elected in 1968. There's this terrible fear that the war will continue to drag on because we're so cocky and proud that we can't find ways to end it. And I think people in my generation were asking, okay, when, do, when I become 18, 60 days later, I'm in Vietnam, yeah. Um, and I think that that was a big thing for me. That was a really, really big deal. So for, the, for this story, <clears throat> I wanted the presence of Vietnam in the background, because Holling is still only in seventh grade. So it's still in the background. It's five years away from when he's gonna get drafted, though he's aware of that. Um, so what I did, no kidding. Um, remember microfiche, that microfilm, not microfiche. So I went to the library and I got the New York Times for, let's see, it was September 1, 1967 to June 30, 1968. I read every page of the New York Times for that whole year and took notes on that. Things that struck me that might not be the big ones that you mentioned, but things that were still part of that wallpaper. Um, Jerry Kuzman is t uh, pitching and Tom Seaver is pitching for the Mets. His salary, $24,000 a year, which is less than every time a minor league player gets up to hit at, at bat, less than that. So I tried to find things like that. What movies were out? I looked at the ads. And it wasn't the case that all that stuff went in, but it was the case that it told me a lot about what was going on in the period. I thought that would be simple. You know, I'd lived it, right, 11, 12 years old. It wasn't, my memory was not at all what I was finding in there. Um, and it had amazing kind of ramifications. Um, listening to Lyndon Johnson say, we can't leave Vietnam, we've lost too many men which is exactly the same strategy that, or the, the same what well, line that was used for later wars too. George Bush says exactly the same thing. We can't leave, we've lost too many. Which of course ensures that you just continue on in an endless cycle. So that was the big thing for trying to weave it in. Um, where do these small items come that I think um, Holling would have noticed?